переходим. И на старт рекорд. Рекорд, рекорд, рекорд. И стоп рекордим. Okay. We will see. When time is running, you're recording. Mm -hmm. to now, one change in the plan for the coming seminars. The next seminar by Dr. Sylvia Priori will be the last. The seminar that was supposed to be last by Professor Flaubert from Switzerland is moved to next fall. So this, this is the change. So there will be only one more seminar before the end of the semester. So today we have uh, Dr. Glenn Fishman, uh, who came here from some obscure city on a little island surrounded by three rivers. <coughs> but anyway, he crossed the Mississippi to come here, and we appreciate it. Across the Atlantic to come here. Across the Atlantic, that's right. He just came from Berlin and Prague, and he is a absolutely jet lagged. But I've seen him giving great seminars before when he was jet lagged. I don't think it should be an issue. Anyway, uh, Glenn uh, received his undergraduate from Cornell in chemistry, I think. and then his uh, MD at Stanford, and went to Boston for his continuous, uh, continued medical training at um, uh, Mass General. And then it was, uh, I think, New York all the way, right? With, uh, in Mount, in, uh, first in uh, Albert Einstein. Did you work with David Spray? He worked with David Spray and, and Einstein on the gap junctions. And then, uh, trying to remember, then, uh, then um, Mount Sinai in New York. And finally, he is now the head of cardiology and in charge of molecular cardiovascular biology at the um, NYU. Those who don't know, it stands for New York University, which is those obscure town. So, Glenn. Thanks, Paul, for the invite. This was a very fun day. I learned a lot. And, uh, I'm glad you could come. Uh, so this is a, a pretty educated audience. So some of the earlier work I may go through relatively quickly. I, I'm hopefully going to show you some stuff uh, a few years old and some newer stuff and some unpublished work. And what we've been focusing on um, is a problem that many of you have been focusing on, which is sudden <coughs> cardiac death. And these are statistics I think all of you are very familiar with. And I guess my interest got piqued as a cardiologist um, with some of these clinical trials. When I was a fellow, we were working on the CAS trial, uh, poisoning patients and giving them so much of some of these drugs that they could barely lift their heads off the bed um, from the toxicity. And it was not only neural toxicity, apparently it was cardiac toxicity as well. And so these, both of these studies are sort of the clinician's uh, worst nightmare where the uh, treated group has a worse outcome than the placebo control group. And I think to us this really just pointed out um, the lack of understanding of some of the mechanisms that uh, underlie cardiac arrhythmias and the fact that pharmacological therapy at that point in time really had not borne fruit and that um, a more molecular mechanistic approach uh, and essentially doing more homework was going to be necessary if this problem was going to be approached. And in our hospital and in your hospital and um, most of the hospitals around the country, this has become uh, the default therapy for patients at risk of sudden cardiac death, which is implanting defibrillators. And um, there are a lot of pressures to continue this. This turns out to be one of the biggest money makers for hospitals putting in these procedures. Um, but, you know, as you might imagine, this is treating the, um, the arrhythmia after it develops. It's certainly not prophylactic therapy in any way. Um, and again, it just underscores the lack of rational therapy that we have um, for these problems. And over the years, you know, the, the first clinical trial showed a rather large benefit of patients implanted with cardiac defibrillators. But these were the highest risk group, patients who had an infarct before, had reduced uh, ejection fractions, and inducible ventricular tachycardia. But not surprisingly, with each successive clinical trial, the indications have gotten somewhat more liberal with non-sustained VT, uh, ejection fractions getting a bit higher, uh, and you can see that the benefit has, um, not surprisingly, gotten smaller and smaller as the group of patients uh, who could potentially receive this therapy has enlarged. And so now we have um, literally hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people who are considered eligible for this therapy, and only a small number of those will actually go on to need the device. So this is a public health nightmare, it's a financial nightmare, and again, points out why we need a different approach. So our laboratory over the past decade or so has focused on two major areas. Uh, I'm going to talk about this one, although I'm happy to stay a little later and talk a bit more about this. And 
we've been interested in understanding some of the derangements that go wrong uh, in the diseased myocardium that are proarrhythmic. And as you'll see, we're focusing on gap junction channels. Uh, the other part of the lab more recently, and really uh, somewhat serendipitously by um, uh, just some experiments that we couldn't have predicted at all, has been doing some more work on cardiovascular development, and particularly on the development of the convection system, and I'll, I'll allude to that a little bit. Um, so I think you can pull anything off the web these days, including a quick time video of, of a protist, um, but I really just show these two movies to contrast independent behavior um, and coordinated behavior. So I imagine these guys, um, they, maybe there's a little signaling going on between them, but I don't really think that they know what the other cell is doing. In contrast this with the human heart, where you've got millions of cells that have to be communicating with, with one another in some way to lead to this wonderful coordinated activity in the human heart so that it can work as a very effective uh, pump. And so as this group knows very well, um, it's the gap junction channels that by and large coordinate this activity um, by virtue of serving as channels, um, uh, intercellular channels that allow for the passage of current from cell to cell and help synchronize the cardiac uh, heartbeat. And this is a schematic I think uh, probably all of you are familiar with uh, as we go from the cellular level showing the gap junctions, the connexin proteins at the intercalated disc. This is a schematic showing the connexins, uh, a hemi-channel in each cell of opposing cell membranes. This is the pore. I think we're going to lose this. Give it a try. Uh, the pore. There's some battery. I'll give it a try. Um, and this is the structure of each of the subunits um, that make up the gap junction proteins. These are the individual connexins embedded in the membrane uh, for transmembrane protein with the amino and carboxy terminus within the cytoplasmic side. And these extracellular loops sitting here, uh, um, sort of mirror image with connexins in the opposing cell. So this area here would be sitting here in the extracellular space. And so there is a, an abundance of data in the literature that has accumulated over a number of years um, demonstrating that gap junction expression uh, and perhaps function is abnormal in the setting of a, a wide variety of pathologic stimuli. Uh, this is a study from Costin and all in a human heart. And in each of these, the left panel is normal staining for connexin 43, where you can fairly nicely see the intercalated disc and the protein is where we expect it to be. And in the disease state, in the peri-infarct uh, region of the heart here, uh, the gap junction protein is not normally localizing to the intercalated discs. Uh, it's a process sometimes described as lateralization, gap junction remodeling, uh, which loosely is defined as it, it's sort of not in the right place or there's not the, the normal amount of it. Usually the level of expression is reduced. Uh, this is a pacing model uh, from the Hopkins group. Again, here we see the nice staining at the intercalated disc, and here's some lateralization of the gap junction protein uh, when heart failure develops in, with rapid pacing. Uh, this is uh, uh, some work from our own lab with pressure overload hypertrophy induced by transverse aortic constriction, aortic banding, leading to pressure overload in the heart. Again, in the normal situation, and a marked down regulation of connexin 43 protein. And as Jeff Saffitz and others uh, have shown more recently, uh, in some of the inherited human syndromes, uh, such as arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, uh, in addition to the primary cell junction protein, connexin 43 seems to be a very sensitive readout uh, with a market down regulation that presumably plays a role in the highly arrhythmic substrate that develops in this group of patients. Uh, so gap junctions, there are 20 or so genes uh, that encode them in most mammalian species, so there's a lot of diversity. And since they can mix and match, there are some rules that govern that, but they can mix and match, and then one could imagine enormous uh, combinatorial diversity among the di different connexin isoforms, where one can get homomeric channels or heterotypic channels as il illustrated by these colors. And you could again imagine that there could be many levels of regulation depending upon how these isoforms come together and form these groups of channels. So um, we in the lab were interested in um, getting from sort of true true and related and trying to show proof-wise uh, using genetic systems that gap junction remodeling and changes in the expression of gap junction proteins actually were proarrhythmic. And so we focused on connexin 43 because that's the major isoform that's expressed in the working ventricular myocardium. Uh, some of the other connexins are expressed in the specialized conduction system. Uh, there are other connexin isoforms that uh, may or may not be expressed in some of the nodal tissue uh, and some of the other specialized regions, including the valves and the vasculature. And so a number of years ago, and I'm going to go through this rather quickly because we've published it a number of years ago. Uh, a number of years ago, David Gutstein in our laboratory developed a conditional knockout mouse 
uh, to ablate connexin 43 specifically in the myocardium. And he took this strategy because the germline knockout, where it was knocked out in every tissue from Janet Rosanne's group in Canada, uh, was perinatal lethal. And those mice developed a congenital heart defect where the right ventricular outflow tract um, was no longer patent. And so blood could not flow to the lungs. And when those mice were born and had to start perfusing their lungs and breathing on their own, they died. Um, that, that region of the heart, the right ventricular outflow tract, um, is probably derived from neural crest tissue. And so the strategy of using a cardiac specific knockout with a myosin heavy chain promoter driving the system, um, in theory, could have circumscribed, uh, could have circumvented uh, the abnormality in the right ventricular outflow tract. And in fact, that's exactly what David saw. So these are some immunostainings showing a wild type mouse heart and a knockout, conditional knockout heart. Uh, the green, of course, is connexin 43, and the red is wheat germ hemagglutinin, just to show the outline of the cells. And you can see at the protein level by Western blot, uh, most of the connexin 43 is gone, and the residual is probably in the non-myocyte fraction of the heart where there's a little bit of connexin is expressed. And if you look at the EM level, uh, the gap junctions are perfectly visible in the wild types, but are more or less surgically removed from the conditional knockouts, whereas the other cell adhesive junctions all seem perfectly intact. Um, there was no effect on any of the other uh, cell junction proteins. So whether we looked at desmoplakin, cadherins, um, in the normal, uh, the staining was no different from what we saw in the conditional knockout. So uh, in, in, in contradistinction to like ARVD and some of these other diseases where loss of the cell junction protein seems to downstream lead to loss of connexin expression or downregulation, we don't sort of see this reverse remodeling where connexin influences the other cell junctions. And that's really consistent um, with what is known about cell junction assembly, the cell adhesion starts first and then the gap junction channels tend to follow that after the cell adhesion occurs. Um, this is dual cell um, uh, voltage clamp recordings. Um, so in the normal, there's abundant current expressed between a pair of cells. There's each of the electrodes impaling this pair of cells which are coupled mostly side to side in this example. Uh, and this is the current that passes between um, comparable end-to-end -end pair of the conditional knockouts. And just point out that this scale here is tenfold reduced compared to the wild type. So um, in many cell pairs, the current was zero. The junctional conductance was zero between the cell pairs. On average, it was about one to two percent um, of the wild type levels. So a very, very marked effect. And this was the overall gross sphere type of these mice. They were perfectly fine until about 30 days after birth, and then all started dying suddenly. Um, and as we've shown before, these were, um, I think, the first mouse model of sudden cardiac death um, from a tachyarrhythmia um, without any obvious uh, demonstrable decrease or abnormality in cardiac structure or function, at least at the gross level. So by echocardiography or by invasive hemodynamics, contractile function was perfectly fine. But all of these mice, uh, there's some sinus arrhythmia here, but essentially develop spontaneous ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation. These are three separate telemetric recordings from mice, but they all went on to die the same way. And if you performed um, invasive uh, EP testing, uh, this is an approach Dave Gutstein developed where actually the electrode is stimulating the inferior and diaphragmatic surface of the heart. Um, all of these mice were very sensitive to that. So this is an S1, S2, looks like S3 protocol here. But pacing them, bringing in a few extra premature stimuli, and these mice got set off into polymorphic VT. So very sensitive. In some cases, just touching the electrode to the surface of the heart would lead them into VT and VF and death. Um, this is the um, setup that Greg Morley um, put together for optical mapping and really brought that first to Mount Sinai and then to NYU when we've taken great advantage of Greg's expertise. I don't think we've taken advantage of Doug, but uh, Greg, we've taken advantage of his expertise. Um, and we wanted to use mapping to better understand what was going on in terms of electrophysiological properties and uh, impulse propagation. So this is just a schematic, these uh, Langendorf hearts, and I'm sure you're all familiar um, here with this technique. This is the pacing electrode, and this is the wave of propagation that we would see over the epicardial surface in a normal mouse heart. And by contrast, this is what the waves would look like in some of these conditional knockout mice. These are on the same time scale. And on average, the conduction velocities in both the transverse and longitudinal directions were reduced by about 50%. So uh, definitely slower. Um, perhaps, and I'll, I'll get back to this in a few more slides, um, perhaps not as slow as one might expect. And in fact, one might expect there'd be no conduction at all in these mice 
wouldn't have lived, but this is the result that we got. We also did some mapping um, in sinus rhythm, and this, this was a real surprise. So these are some mice um, that we developed that have a beta-galactosidase or a laxity reporter gene that lights up the entire cardiac conduction system. And what I want you to focus on here is the left and right bundle and the ramifications of the Purkinje fibers um, out into the left and the right ventricles. So this is a, uh, a wild-type mouse, a control mouse, and these are two examples from conditional knockout mice. And the structure of the conduction system itself, at least by this measure, looks perfectly normal. So in sinus rhythm, the impulse is going to travel um, down to the AV node, the His bundle, and down the bundle branches. And the, the earliest breakthroughs are going to be at the left and the right ventricular apices. And so this first movie is just an example of that. So the breakthroughs that we see are here and here over the right and left ventricles. And so this is what the map looks like. Earliest site over here. This is uh, activating just a little bit later. And so this is the perfectly normal adult apex to base activation that you'd see in virtually all adult mammalian species. So this is an example now of what activation looks like in one of the conditional knockout hearts, and it looks different. Um, and if you put this on, we can see that there look like sort of multiple activation sites that are colliding with one another. Even though the conduction system per se, at least grossly, appears uh, normal, and this, this is sort of the most dramatic example of, of a heart with sort of these aberrant activation patterns, again, in the face of a normal conduction system. So we hypothesized, um, and I don't know that we've actually proved it, but uh, we think this is occurring sort of a, as a functional consequence of uh, uncoupling of the ventricular myocardium, even though the Purkinje fibers, which may have other gap junction channels, such as connexin 40, are coupled normally, and we have this source sink mismatch. So now we have a lot of current that is coming down Purkinje fibers, some thick, some thin. In the normal heart, we think that the thin Purkinje fibers are not carrying enough cur current to activate the underlying myocardium. But when we uncouple the myocardium, we might change the source sink relationship. And so some of these that are normally failing now might be successful and lead to these ectopic activation sites. And this is similar um, in theory at the whole tissue level um, to the paper, I guess, from Rohr in science quite a number of years ago, looking at paradoxical um, conduction uh, with uncoupling. And maybe this is an example of that uh, at the whole heart level. One of the other surprising findings, and the story just gets more and more complicated, is that in these conditional knockout mice, there actually also was electrical remodeling. Um, and we were talking um, earlier today about um, memory and electrical remodeling that might occur with, for instance, um, pacing, right, where the activation sequence of the ventricle is abnormal. It's not coming down the normal conduction system. And one might imagine, in some ways, that, um, sorry, I want to go backwards here. Um, in hearts like this, um, we're not pacing from one site, but we're certainly activating the ventricle in an abnormal way, and this might lead to some sort of electrical remodeling as a consequence of that. Sorry, to show all these again. And so what we see actually um, is some action potential shortening, particularly in the right ventricular myocytes, and an increase in IK1 current. Certainly these are not some of the changes that are typical that you'd see with, with memory and that sort of remodeling, but um, these changes could um, enhance the propensity for having rotors in ventricular tachycardia, um, much the way I think it was a paper from uh, Halife's group, Sammy was the first author, looking at increased IK1 um, as uh, helping uh, rotors anchor themselves and increase the likelihood. And in fact, every once in a while we're lucky and we have the camera in the right place and we can map this uh, uh, incessant ventricular tachycardia. So it looks like there are you know, at least three ingredients that are contributing to the substrate. Conduction slowing, these aberrant activation patterns that might lead to wavefront um, collisions, and electrical remodeling, including shortening of the action potential duration, and, and also perhaps uh, anchoring of the rotors because of the increase in IK1 current. Um, there may be more to the story. The more we look, we keep finding different um, factors that might be creating this. But um, I think it's not just as simple as having some uncoupling and slowing of conduction. Um, so this really got back, uh, and I'm only going to talk about this briefly because I think you're um, already had this lovely paper trying to look at and uh, think about some of the issues of why in the setting of markedly reduced coupling um, impulse propagation might still be successful at, at reasonable conduction velocities um, and did some computational modeling um, of the effects of uh, looking at the clefts and localization of sodium currents at the cleft. 
uh, the issue of aphaptic coupling or capacitative coupling, um, and suggested that under a certain set of conditions, which may or may not exist in the normal heart, um, that there is a surprising increased preserved conduction velocity um, that one can see um, if one can bring this aphaptic mechanism into play. And um, Charlie Peskin and his group took some of, <coughs> excuse me, Fred, took some of the um, numbers that we uh, obtained in our conditional knockout mice in terms of uh, junctional conduction, uh, size of the myocytes, and did similar modeling um, and found actually, not surprisingly, similar results. So if you have um, a 30 nanometer gap um, and you have 95% of the sodium channels at the intercalated disk, and gap junction coupling is reduced to about 2% of normal, conduction velocity is about 14%. But if the gap is even smaller that allows for this aphaptic uh, mechanism to take place, the conduction velocity speeds up a bit. Um, and in, in this, this is sort of interesting, in an in-between a gap size of 12 nanometers, you actually see um, this alternating between um, gap junction mediated and aphaptic coupling, and this will be a little clearer. So this is pure gap junction mediated coupling through a strand of these cells. I guess I have to change this. Put on the next movie. Right here. So that is the effect of coupling. And here we see this alternating, where from one cell to the next is aphaptic, and from the next one to the next is gap junction mediated. So I don't know if that's the answer for what's going on, why we have virtually no gap junction channels between many of these myocytes. Perhaps there's a little bit of connexin 40, 45, some other connexin. But at least in, in dual cell recordings, gap junction coupling is between 0 and 1 or 2 percent of normal and yet the conduction velocity is only reduced by about 50%. So it remains an, an intriguing problem that we continue to work on. Um, just as an aside, I wanted to mention this other experiment because there's been a lot of studies, um, both experimental in the laboratory and moving into the clinic um, with stem cell therapy for myocardial regeneration. So this is another experiment David did, Gutstein did, where he made embryonic stem cells that were null for connexin 43. So he knocked out both alleles, both chromosomes. Um, and so this is, again, a Western blot in the double null here, making no gap junction proteins. He injected these cells. So um, they're going to express every cardiac marker just like normal, except for connexin 43. He injected these cells into a wild-type blastocyst to make chimeric mice. And um, this blastocyst was from the Rosa 26 line, so all the cells will turn blue. So essentially, we're going to make a chimeric mouse where every tissue has a contribution from the ES cells as well as these blastocysts, including the heart. And so this is, um, on the top, is a mouse that's made completely from these rows of 26. And so every tissue, if you excal stained it, would be blue. Normal gap junctions at low power and high power. And in these chimeric hearts, we essentially have these holes in the heart where this cluster of cells, this focus of cells, uh, came from one of these ES cells that were null for connexin 43, again at low power and at high power. Um, but of course, they make all the normal contractile proteins, and so they can beat normally, but they're not going to be well coupled. And so um, this is now a map paste over here in a wild type part. And again, we get a nice smooth wave of conduction spreading across the epicardial surface. Mm -hmm. And this is from one of these chimeric hearts where essentially you can see the wave is running into these obstacles which um, presumably correspond to these foci of uncoupled cells. And so it's probably no surprise at all that these mice have spontaneous arrhythmias. And it should be no surprise that when uh, clinicians are injecting, for instance, skeletal muscle cells into the heart, which don't form gap junction channels, uh, they act surprised that these uh, humans develop arrhythmias and need a defibrillator's place. So I think this, is, again, is another example of the clinic getting ahead of the experimentation where the answer sort of could be easily known before putting these patients at risk. So connexin 43 null mice um, obviously are not um, a model of any human disease. And so it's always nice to find um, a bona fide human disease and see if you can learn a little bit more about what you're working on. And so oculodento digital dysplasia um, is a rather long name for a syndrome. Uh, but the JABS lab from Hopkins um, a couple of years ago, 2003 now, reported um, linkage of connexin 43 mutations to this syndrome. 
And since that time, over the past five or six years, um, there's been an increasing number of mutations reported in individuals and families with this syndrome. So this is uh, an autosomal dominant disease. Um, and these uh, poor individuals have um, really a pleiotrophic manifestation. So connexin 43 is not expressed only in the heart. It's expressed in many different tissues and lineages, including the brain, uh, obviously in the teeth, in, in uh, the developing soft tissue. Um, and so they have uh, many of these findings, neurological findings, ocular findings, tooth, tooth anomaly, syndactyly, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, and in a subset of patients, there seems to be an increased uh, propensity for having cardiac arrhythmias, although by no means is it the most dominant aspect of the phenotype. Um, this is a, a, a cartoon showing where some of these mutations are located, really spread throughout the protein, the gap junction protein, although the carboxy terminus is relatively spared. Um, and so I think there are really not yet enough uh, mutations to come up with any clear genotype, phenotype correlations, um, although, as I mentioned, this area is spared. So several groups, um, including Mario Delmar and Dale Laird um, and their groups, have, similar to the way potassium channels and sodium channel mutations for long QT syndrome and Brugada and so forth have been assessed, have looked at what some of the molecular phenotypes of these mutations are. And again, not surprisingly, the protein um, either traffics abnormally, where it gets stuck in the Golgi or ER, and doesn't get out to the membrane, um, whereas the other group gets out to the membrane and actually can form gap junction plaques, but doesn't seem to gate normally. So um, again, very similar to some of the uh, sarcomomal ionic channels. Uh, same sorts of phenotypes. So we were particularly interested in um, this mutation at position 130, where an isoleucine was mutated to a threonine, because this was, at least in the JABS report, uh, the one family that seemed to have the most fulminant evidence of having cardiac arrhythmias, with several fam family members dying of sudden cardiac death, ventricular tachycardia, sinus, uh, sick sinus syndrome. And so we thought we would make a mouse model of this particular mutation and uh, try to assess the cardiac phenotype. Um, so we, in, in this case, did a knock-in and just changed that one residue uh, to introduce it. Um, this is now a, a northern blotch is showing that the, the site-directed mutagenesis and the gene targeting did not affect the level of connexin 43 expression at the RNA level uh, at all. Um, so this was the first hint that the experiment worked well. Uh, so again, this is a human foot for those of you who have been looking at mice for too long. And you can see the soft tissue syntactically here. And these are our knock-in mice, and you can see that there's fusion of the soft tissue uh, between the digits here. Um, and so this, um, I guess there's some irony in that you normally clip off the toes to genotype them, but in this case, you don't really have to because they're already telling you that they're carrying the mutations. Uh, the hearts themselves structurally look perfectly normal. Uh, we didn't see anything grossly going on um, at this level of resolution. Um, but there was a fairly profound influence on the expression of the connexin 43 protein. Uh, so this is a pretty busy slide, but what we have here are Western blots. This is an antibody that recognizes, um, in theory, so there's caveats with all connexin antibodies, but recognizes all forms of connexin 43, including unphosphorylated and phosphorylated at whatever and what, whatever sites. And the first four lanes are wild type, and the next four lanes are the knockings. Uh, this is an antibody that, um, again, in theory, only recognizes unphosphorylated connexin 43. And so you can see that the baseline unphosphorylated levels seem perfectly okay, but there's this aberrant pattern where it's not getting phosphorylated very normally. Uh, and this is quantified here below. So the total level is markedly reduced, but it's essentially all because P1 and P2, these slower mobility forms, are not getting formed. Uh, if we look uh, by immunohistochemistry, either with uh, DAB staining or fluorescent staining, uh, there's abundant gap junction channels in the wild type, but the signal is much reduced um, in these knock-in mice. So the protein does not see, it, it gets to the junctions, uh, but it doesn't seem to do so very effectively or efficiently. So we wanted to know um, which phosphorylation sites in particular were being affected here. Uh, Paul Lampe uh, out in Seattle has developed a panel of antibodies that are specific for different phosphorylation sites. And we were, um, based on some uh, tissue culture work that Paul and others had done, were uh, particularly interested in this triplet of serines, 325, 328, and 330, that seem to be the target for casein kinase 1. Um, and casein kinase 1 dependent phosphorylation seems to play a role in the trafficking of connexin 43 and getting to the membrane and being stable there and accumulating. Um, and we also looked at this 365 um, site as well. And so these are Western blots. 
And in this particular case, we're alternating a wild type with one of the knock-ins every other lane. And again, so for panconexin 43, we're missing the phosphoforms. For 365, we see almost none of it in the knock-ins. Um, and for the 325, we also see almost none of it in the knock-ins. This is just vinculin and gap DH for different loading controls. So again, we're making connexin 43 the um, baseline form, but it's not getting processed and it's not getting phosphorylated at either of these particular sites. Uh, and again, this is the correlate uh, immunohistochemistry. On the top is uh, in the wild types, and in the bottom are the ODDD mutant hearts. And in each of these cases, a marked reduction in total connexin 43, the casein kinase site, um, and the PKA site, all virtually almost not detectable with either of these phosphor forms. Um, and again, as with the conditional knockout, um, even though the connexin 43 levels were markedly reduced, the other junctional proteins, ZO1, tetanherin, placoglobin, beta catenin, uh, desmoplakin, are all essentially at normal levels. Um, there was a little hint that desmoplakin might be upregulated a tiny bit. It didn't reach statistical significance, but you sort of got the feeling if you did enough of these, maybe it would be up 10 or 20 percent. So functionally, what was going on, um, Dave Spray, uh, did some Lucifer yellow dye injections um, and quantitatively um, did some junctional conductions measurements. And so there was about a 50% reduction in the level of coupling between these cell pairs from the mutant mice. And when we did optical mapping, um, a modest reduction in conduction velocities. Uh, there's a wild type and three of the mutant hearts. So about a 25% reduction both in the, uh, in the CV max and the longitudinal and the transverse directions. Um, so not as severe, uh, so it's somewhat of a hypomorphic allele compared to the knockout, and the phenotype is somewhat in between. Um, these mice, um, again, corresponding to the moderate levels of reduction of connexin 43, um, had inducible ventricular tachycardia. So again, this is program stimulation in, in the wild type, premature beats, they come back in sinus rhythm. The ODDD had inducible VT, or in some cases, just in the Langendorf hearts, if you hang them, developed spontaneous VT that was hard to get them out of. Um, but in vivo, yeah? These are the heads, right? These are heads. The homozygous are embryonic lethal. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, so they're uh, really different than the connection 43 knockout heads. Uh, right? You yes. To the oh, yes. Okay. Yes. Right. So if, if, if we looked, I guess, in embryos or fetuses, whatever, whatever they lasted to, Probably there'd be almost no connexin 43 in homozygotes, would be my guess. Um, so they don't develop spontaneous arrhythmias in vivo and don't seem to die suddenly. So again, an in-between phenotype, um, which in, in some ways is consistent with the human phenotype where um, by and large they don't seem to be dropping dead from cardiac arrhythmias. Um, although one doesn't know in the setting of a second hit, they had a heart attack, high blood pressure, cardiomyopathy of some sort, they might kind of be primed for having um, an arrhythmia. So the question then, because you know, these are rare syndromes, and I think the, the lessons learned from long QT and these other uh, inherited diseases are that they provide sort of a paradigm for thinking about the much more common acquired arrhythmia. So the concept of repolarization reserve, um, and, and that's uh, diminished with, uh, let's say, long QT syndrome, um, brings to bear what's going on in a lot of electrical remodeling with all sorts of diseases. So the, the sort of analogous question in terms of gap junctions is, is this abnormality in phosphorylation a very common feature of gap junction remodeling that we see in common acquired forms of heart disease? So that gets us back to this, um, this TAC model uh, of transverse aortic banding, which one um, uses as a model, let's say, of high blood pressure or aortic stenosis or any sort of pressure overload on the heart. So the surgery is performed by putting a suture uh, around the transverse aorta. Uh, these are just some cross-section histological sections uh, from sham two weeks and four weeks after aortic banding. You can see there's pretty profound um, hypertrophy of the myocardium. Uh, these are catheters, um, um, malar catheters inserted into the right and to the left carotid artery, so before and after the constriction. And you can see with the aortic banding, the systolic pressure before the constriction is quite high. And you can't really see this, but it's lower. So in this particular mouse, there's about a 40 millimeter gradient which is quite significant, um, leading to this cardiac hypertrophy. So this is what goes on if you harvest hearts at various time points after the aortic banding. These are two different antibodies. Uh, this is one from Paul uh, Lappy that recognizes 
amino end of connexin 43. This is one from the carboxy. And they're not identical, but they give you a, the general picture that over time, there's a fairly significant downregulation of total connexin 43. And if we look with the phospho-specific antibodies, there's also a reduction in the amount at the 325 uh, site and the 365 site, so the casein kinase site and the PKA site. Um, and it starts falling off relatively early. So within about a week, uh, between one week and two weeks, we can see certainly at the PKA site and this site as well, it's starting to fall off in a fairly reasonable fashion. Um, this is immunostaining, so again, from sham to one week, a, a fairly noticeable drop off in the amount of connexin 43 protein, and then it becomes pretty fr profound by one to two months um, after imposition of the pressure overload. Um, again, immunohistochemistry, we see that. Nice gap junction channels in the sham, but it falls off very quickly at the PKA site and also at the casein kinase dependent site. So there's almost no detectable phosphoconnexin 43 at one to two months after aortic banding. Um, so concomitant with that is slowing of the conduction velocity. Again, it's not dramatic, um, but within one week and certainly by eight weeks, there's a, um, a, a measurable and statistically significant fall off in conduction velocity. So can we do anything about it? Uh, and, you know, I often lament the fact that, you know, in the last 10 years in the lab, we um, have made many mice sick, we have cured none, and we've made maybe a handful better. Um, but we always like to think about therapy because that's ultimately our goal. So is there anything we can do to try to reverse or prevent this pathologic gap junction um, remodeling? And so, you know, that in some ways brings us back to the patient again um, and looking at clinical data. Um, so there were two landmark studies, the Rawls trial and the Ephesus trial, um, these are patients with heart failure who were treated with mineralocorticoid antagonists, um, and they did better in terms of their heart failure, but the major benefit of both of these trials was a decrease in sudden cardiac death, suggesting that there was an effect on, their, um, on having arrhythmias, although that wasn't specifically documented. In general, that's what we think of the cause of, of sudden cardiac death would be VT or VF. Um, so we tried to set up um, a somewhat analogous mouse study where we could test the effects of mineralocorticoid blockade. So four groups of mice, um, a group that had aortic banding and a sham group, uh, and in each of these groups, half of the mice either got a standard diet or a standard diet supp supplemented with spironolactone, which is a mineralocorticoid antagonist, which is the drug um, that was used in the first study. This is the cheap generic type that drug companies don't want to do trials on because it's basically off patent. Um, and so we followed them for four weeks after uh, the banding or the sham operation and uh, with or without drug, and then performed a battery of, of, of assays at the four-week point. Um, and so the mice developed hypertrophy. So these are the two sham groups, and these are the two aortic banding groups. And whether they got spironolactone or not, the heart still increased in size. They still developed cardiac hypertrophy. Um, and there still was a decrease in their function by four weeks, so fractional shortening fell in both of the aortic banding groups, and the drug treatment didn't do anything about that. So um, in, in terms of their contractile function um, and their enlargement, the spironolactone did not inhibit that at all. So no effect of hypertrophy or contractile function. Now, if we did Western blots to look at what the connexin 43 looks like, uh, again, four groups. This is an antibody for pan-connexin 43. Um, what we can see, and, and there's three in each of these groups on this particular Western, um, with aortic banding, again, we see a loss in the phosphorylated forms and some preservation of the hypophosphorylated and unphosphorylated forms. But with the spironolactone, we get a little bit increase in this processing. We see more of the phosphorylated forms of connexin 43 and a little bit less. So there's a bit of a shift here. Um, and interestingly, even in the sham group, there seems to be somewhat of a shift up to more of the phosphorylated forms. So it may not only be an effect uh, or an interaction with the pathology, it may be that spironolactone is actually interfering or influencing uh, protein kinases or, or protein phosphatases, um, but we haven't sorted that out yet. But if we look at the amino staining level, um, this is again the sham group without drug, the sham group with drug. This is what we expected with aortic banding without drug. So again, this is the market down regulation. But when we treat with spironolactone, we get a lot more immunoreactive connexin 43. It's a little bit more punctate looking. It doesn't form as typical gap junction plaques as we might see at control, but there's definitely more of the connection 43 getting out there to the junctional membrane 
uh, and accumulating. And if we look at the functional correlate um, of that, uh, so here's sham without spironolactone, uh, sham with spironolactone, no significant difference. As we showed before, if we do the aortic banding, there's a fairly significant slowing of conduction velocity. This is measured in the transverse direction. And there's an improvement. There's a statistically significant improvement compared to the untre untreated uh, group. It doesn't quite make it up statistically up to the control levels, but it's moving in the right direction uh, and certainly better than the untreated group. So, you know, we're left with a number of different models um, of connexin 43 abnormalities. We've got wild type mice, we've got um, heterozygous mice, and this is certainly a, a bit more controversial in terms of what's going on with their conduction velocity. Maybe it's here in St. Louis or Boston, and maybe it's here in New York, but you know, it, it's in this range. In the TAC mice, there's uh, a bit of a slowing of conduction velocity. In the ODDD mutant mice, a little bit slower. And in the conditional knockouts, quite a bit slower. And if we look at the Connexin 43 content um, in each of these mice, at least by Western blotting, it goes from 100% to 50. This is almost the same as that. It falls off to 10%, and this way down to 1%. So it's an interesting relationship. Um, and it's still somewhat perplexing to me. Um, but there's um, sort of a sweet spot, I would say, between 50% and lower than that, that in this area, things are not awful. Uh, it doesn't seem to be, on its own, incredibly pro-arrhythmic. But as we fall below 50%, and I can't tell you because we don't have another point to fit in here, let's say at 30%, that's when we start getting where perhaps the gap junction slowing and the consequences of that are sufficient uh, to support spontaneous um, cardiac arrhythmias and inducible arrhythmias. So um, the last group of experiments related to that is, again, going back to genetic models where we are interested in proving the relevance of this abnormal phosphorylation. And so um, we made one last group of mice where we mutated the triplet of amino acids of the casein kinase one site and either changed all three of those serines to alanine residues so that they cannot get phosphorylated, uh, non-phosphorylatable residues, well, we changed all three of them to glutamic acids so that they would be constitutively negatively charged and perhaps act like they were always phosphorylated, constitutively phosphorylated. Um, so this um, is a somewhat complicated biochemical slide. Um, so uh, Triton X solubility or insolubility is a biochemical method used to um, try and separate the connexin protein into that which is in the junctional membrane and that which is not. So the Triton X insoluble pellets is thought to be the fraction that's at the gap junction um, in, in the junctional membrane. And so these are now um, Western blots from each of the five genotypes. Um, and with one extra lane where this is wild type protein that got treated with alkaline phosphatase to take all of the phosphates off of it. So this is how Connexin 43 runs. Um, with no phosphate groups on it at all. So this is kind of the baseline, fastest running band. Um, so in the middle here is the wild type. And so we can see that these are all running faster than that. So these are all somewhat phosphorylated. Um, with the SAAA homozygote, so both alleles are carrying this mutation that can't get phosphorylated, we see that the predominant form um, is running here. So it's getting phosphorylated at some other sites, but it doesn't seem to get processed very effectively beyond that up to these higher sites. This is the heterozygote, and so we start seeing some of uh, behaving like the wild type, but also some of this that's not getting phosphorylated at the particular site. And then these are kind of interesting. This is the homozygous for the carrying the glutamic acid mutation, or the heterozygous, and these are, these are moving in the gel as if they are constitutively phosphorylated, so they're held up in the gel and moving like the P2 or P3 forms. Now, if we treat all of these with alkaline phosphatase to see what things look like, um, this is the A mutation, and it looks like there's not, and this is one way actually to quantify how much total connexin 43 there is, because it's reducing it essentially to one band, except for this one, which I'll get to. So there seems to be the least of the SAAA mutation, the SA heterozygote and wild type, and SE mutations are all the same. These are interesting, so this is running like the S. E, that's what this one is, and this is the wild type band. So again, the SE is holding it up in the gel a little bit. So this seems, this mutation seems to be the least stable, or at least its steady state abundance is the lowest compared to any of the other genotypes and mutant proteins being expressed. 
Um, so we wanted to see what might happen in response to another pathologic stimulus, um, one that we could do experiments a little bit more quickly than aortic banding. And so this is uh, ischemia. And on top, uh, at baseline, and then the bottom after 30 minutes of ischemia, these are done in Langendorf. Uh, so they're just no-flow ischemia. Isolated perfused hearts, turn off the scalp cock for a half hour, and then harvest the hearts. Um, and these are double stained for connexin 43 and NCAN herein. So the wild types, um, this is the normal. The S3A, um, there's a suggestion that there's less connexin 43 there. And the S3E is either equivalent to the wild type, or sometimes you can convince yourself there's a little bit more than in the wild type. But if you look at enough of these blindly, I don't think we can really separate these. Uh, if we look at ischemia, I do think that this looks a little bit better preserved in terms of connexin 43 remaining at the gap junctions. The S3A certainly looks like the worst, where we start really seeing what looks like the cells being outlined with lateralization uh, of the connexin 43. So uh, these are early experiments, but I think it's giving us a hint that the S3E is um, perhaps somewhat protective to a pathologic stimulus, and the S3A actually sensitizes it, and the, the, the phenotype, or at least the molecular phenotype, is somewhat worse. Um, we're trying to figure out uh, about mapping these to see what the effects on conduction velocity. It turned out after 30 minutes of ischemia, um, we can't even really pace these very effectively. We're going to have to cut, we're cutting back now to about 15 minutes is sort of the threshold. Um, and so we're going to have to repeat these at that same time point to see what the gap junctions are looking like. But um, it's conceivable then that this particular triplet of amino acids uh, is very important kind of in the metabolism. Uh, and trafficking stability of connexin 43, and perhaps we could exploit that um, by using drugs that influence casein kinase um, activity uh, in the heart. So, um, just to summarize all of this, cardiac arrhythmias um, cause a lot of morbidity and mortality, and uh, what we have to offer right now, at least pharmacologically, is woefully inadequate, and even though the device-based therapies um, are quite effective, for all the reasons I talked about at the beginning are, are somewhat of a nightmare. Um, gap junction remodeling is very common. Um, it almost seems to be the default behavior of the heart to almost anything you throw at it uh, in terms of pathology, whether there are genetic diseases um, that are affecting connexins, genetic diseases affecting um, uh, other junctional proteins or other sorts of acquired pathologies. And it's associated uh, with um, severe modification uh, and downregulation of phosphorylation. Uh, and as I mentioned, we see that with ODDD and uh, acquired, uh, uh, acquired cardiomyopathies. Um, reverse gap junction modeling is associated with improved behavior electrophysiologically. Um, I sort of lament the fact that at least in the C57 black mice that we used for the aortic banding studies, uh, we didn't get VT with the aortic banding. Um, and there are some other strains of mice that seem to be more susceptible to arrhythmias. And I suppose we could go on um, and repeat those studies in another strain and see if we actually get VT and then prevent it with the spironolactone. Um, but I think the improvement in conduction velocity and sort of the molecular improvement in gap junction reverse remodeling um, was encouraging. And in general, I think strategies that might promote reverse remodeling are certainly uh, an area worth pursuing. So let me thank the people who contributed to the work. Nelly um, made the ODDD mice and, and characterized them. Uh, Frank and Josh Sean Q were involved in the aortic banding study. Uh, Greg really has been our master of uh, optical mapping um, and sort of all things biomedical um, in our group um, and some of the other students who were working on the studies. Paul, I mentioned, uh, very helpful with the biochemical analyses and antibodies. Dave Spray involved in some of the patch clamping. Um, and it's always nice to get money from different places. When it's so uh, let me stop now and take, uh, take some questions. Thanks. Any questions? You're in the front. <laughs> um, so, so most of your research is looking at what happens when connections go down. You build a nice curve of how it goes when you drop down from 100%. Uh, we, we, we've studied for s several years already what happens when it goes up. So, and there are several models to that. For example, hibernating uh, species, which in anticipation of, of uh, reduced function of connections during hypothermia, first because of Q10, so reduction in temperature, so conductance goes down, but also because probably trafficking of 
is pretty much stopped, there is no expression anymore. Mm -hmm. So they essentially overexpress the connections. Uh, and we've picked up some difference in conduction velocity because of that, although it was not very, very large. So, but, but nevertheless, what would you expect? How much do you need to upregulate, let's say, uh, and, and by upregulating, I mean, of course, to deliver to the proper place, uh, to make it in a functional state, to, to have appreciable improvement in conduction velocity? Yeah, so I think the problem, and I don't know if it's as much a problem um, with tools we have available to measure conduction velocity and inherent limitations in, in those techniques or the nonlinearity of the relationship between conduction velocity and connection content. So, you know, at least as we go in the down direction and reduction, you can have almost a log order change in connection content and a fairly trivial change on the order of 20%, 30% in conduction velocity. Um, and you know, the shape of the curve I have would predict we're sort of asymptotically maxing out and that if you doubled or tripled connection content, so, you know, so maybe you'd see 5%, 3% increase. I, I don't know what you're measuring, you know, what you're seeing, but I wouldn't expect it to get much more uh, rapid. <coughs> Is that in line with what you see? Well, it, and unfortunately, Yoram's paper, uh, where it all started, he never actually moved beyond 100%. As far as I remember. <laughs> 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 I apologize. <laughs> no, but we do see indeed very small increase. And uh, essentially, I was wondering if there is any good idea of how to study it, and how to create a model like that. So, um, I, you, you could make a transgenic mouse and just overexpress it. Um, it it's, it's not clear to me, though, that there's not some auto-regulation where the amount you can deliver to the membrane won't max out, and that if you try to make more than that, it's just going to increase degradation and get processed, and you're kind of saturated. Uh, I don't have any data to support that, but that wouldn't surprise me at all. I mean, there have been some mice made that overexpressed Connexin 45 on top of 43, um, and you know, in that case, the evidence suggested maybe that was the, those heterocellular heterotypic junctions might inhibit and, and slow. But I don't know what would happen with one, but the approach would be to just make a transgenic model uh, and see what happened. But, you know, I guess unless you were using that as sort of a rescue for other sorts of diseases to see if, if uh, it would improve arrhythmogenicity, that's not something we'd want to do. Just to make a comment, I think you know, there, are, there are many other things that are affected by gas jacking a cup. First of all, there is the expression level, but the expression level and function are not linearly related. Right? So one. Number two, there, there is the distribution. The distribution is different. That means all kinds of direction dependent effects that are reported to origins. But putting all of that aside, there are other effects of gas jacking a cup. Number one, it's not just the velocity. Repolarization, and we tend to forget that repolarization is also effective, and the dispersion of repolarization is strongly dependent, probably more strong, stronger than velocity, on uh, gap junction connectivity. So, knowing the heterogeneity of fine channel expressions, which is exaggerated in disease, and on top of which, reduction gap junction coupling could be very homogenic in that. I haven't seen a lot of work being focused on the effect of repolarization and dispersion of repolarization in that context. So that's number one issue. Right. I think I think that's right. So with with uncoupling, exactly as you're saying, we should see more heterogeneity. And I, I think there was a time, this was before we moved, where we were trying to get more accurate action potentials. And, and sort of look at the dispersion and look at the heterogeneity in, in the conditional knockout mice, which we predict would be markedly increased. There's a time course of remodeling of gap junctions yeah. and the time course of remodeling of high jumps. You know, so, you know, if one is remodeled, the other one is probably remodeled. And then you have, you know, and all of this is heterogeneous. Right. So, so when you start and having all this, you know, heterogeneity is now amplified because they're not so well connected. Right. So, so again, it gets back to, I think, measuring CV itself, as I think we've shown, is a fairly insensitive measure of, of all the pathology that's going on in the heart. Um, and because repolarization depends on much smaller currents, the effect could 
production is pretty robust. That's why it's not so dependent on gap junction coupling. You can change gap junction coupling by a lot and get small changes in velocity. But visualization is a different animal. I'm, I'm not sure how you can measure it. I'm, I'm not sure the optical method is that you need to look at heterogeneity of extra potential in, in the face of the attention of coupling because uh, I'm just not sure. Uh, have you perhaps looked in, when you have these multiple breakthroughs, that's very interesting. Have you looked at all, tried to correlate a little bit with histology? Are there any possible preferential transverse paths or anything that would go somehow from the hinges into the epitardium? Yeah, so, you know, to the extent that the Laxey reporter gene is showing us all of the specialized conduction wiring, it's normal. Uh, we had thought about sort of the Lugol solution experiments back then uh, to, you know, sort of ablate out the the endocardial, subendocardial region and see how the pattern changed. Ultimately, we ended up um, pacing from the endocardium and showing that we got normal breakthroughs at, at the overlying epicardial surface to try to show that there was nothing intrinsically wrong with the muscle and that it wasn't taking some meandering pathway to get from endocardial to epicardial. And so we, we ended up concluding that it was this mismatch, sort of a functional rather than a structural abnormality. with spiralactin, would you have a look at the arrhythmias? Yeah, so the problem was we didn't get any inducible VT even right. without drugs, so we couldn't, well, we didn't get it with it either, but we couldn't measure any improvement in that parameter. Is the IK1 the only current that's upregulated in the connective point conditional um, We did not do a as thorough as would have done um, cataloging of all of the currents. And I'm trying to remember from the paper what else we looked at. I think we looked at ITO. Um, and I, I'd have to pull it out. And is IK1 targeted to a particular, is it, it the lateral membrane? It, it was it? really RV myocytes as opposed to LV. Uh -huh. But we didn't try to separate LV further into endo, epi, or, or mid. So the, the other question I suppose to pull up is, Colocalization of fine changes in the gap junction. If you right. do something better with gap junction, maybe you lose the colocalization of sodium channel. Right. IKR, IKR, is, IKR is there too. Right? And I wonder what that does. It's hard to separate all of the things. We pick our favorite protein, yeah. but, right. but it's grossly simple. It's very hard to do. You think you do something very clean in, in this yeah. animal? Yeah. Um, do you think the upregulation of the I, uh, IK1 will be related to the like related to the uh, to the connecting body free knockout? Because it seems to me that uh, when you increase the extra potential duration, it might come to increase the excitability of the vertex to increase the conduction velocity. So I guess I. I'm thinking the reason it went up was because the, the excitation pattern is abnormal, and so the different regions of the heart are getting excited from the left or the right instead of, let's say, from apex to base. So stress-strain relationships, all the things that lead to ion channel remodeling are happening because of that. But I'm not sure I followed your logic for the second part of, of, IK, of what IK1 was doing. Can you tell me that again? Because I, I feel that when you decrease the actual potential duration, which decrease the effective period, period. Right. So w which will like somehow may be possible to increase the conduction velocity, I guess. Or maybe not. Well, it might change the wavelength, but I don't know if it's going to change the conduction velocity. That'll be the other part of the equation. Yeah. So right. have you looked at whether like the reduction of the actual potential duration is related to the the expression of the connection point three. Like when you when the expression is reduced, it's, it's also the extra potential duration um, has the same trend of decrease. Um, so in all of those hearts, the connection forty three content is almost gone. 
Um, and the IK1 measurements, you know, are sort of a summary of dozens and dozens of cells. But I, we don't have any other better way to correlate individual <coughs> at a cellular level. I mean, these are all summary data, averages. I, I think I'm still missing the point a little bit. Okay, we're getting some Okay. So perhaps uh, you saw how with CV changes with gap junction, slowly decreasing gap junction. We made IK1 do the same. Hardly ever the question. Ah. Well, we only did this in in, one. in mice that have a certain level of connection 43, 0, 1, 2 percent. We didn't do it at the 10 and 15. Right, okay. Yes, the, the, the idea is that IK1 also reduces the total group, but it increased IK1. But in mice lacking IK1 by dominant negative, they don't have. Right, but these have more IK1. These have more IK1. That's the point. The point is. Yeah. Right. The effect on conduction also is very small. But they're not reciprocally related. To the right. Uh, why is the connection 43 deficiency in the heart affect the activation pattern in the ventricle? Ah, does, so does it affect the connection system? No. No. So we think, uh, you know, I had a nice cartoon of this, but as I was explaining, we, we think that there, the Purkinje network includes thick bundles and thin bundles, you know, spread throughout the endocardial surface of the heart, that the thin bundles normally, when they make their Purkinje muscle junctions, fail, right? The source sink relationship is such they don't have enough source current. But when you uncouple the muscle that the Purkinje fiber is making its junction with, it's easier. Now the source current is sufficient to activate the working muscle. And so regions that normally fail now succeed, and they succeed in locations that, that are in different parts of the Purkinje network. And so we start seeing activations here and there. Does that make sense? Yeah, but do you have any data about the KMJ? Purkinje and the cardiac junction? Um, I can so show you lots of s pictures of PMJs from, from, from different transgenic mice, but data in what sense? I mean, recording across it? So does, does the gap junction, gap junction um, between the pinky cell and the cardio cell is decreased evenly in the whole heart? No, but the Purkinje's are going to be making other isoforms of gap junction. So as a cable, their properties should be maintained, right? But the working muscle is essentially all connects in 43, maybe a little bit of something else. And no, so it's, it's specifically uncoupled. We have not done, let's say, EM or staining exactly at the junctions to see what's forming at, at, at the PMJ. No, I, I, I'm asking is the kinetic point three is decreased evenly in the, in the whole heart, especially in the PMJ? I'm not sure how we can measure that. If not, um, if it's decreased evenly in the whole heart, why the pattern is, is, is different? I think it should be different. Because uh, I mean, every, Purkinje, every Purkinje network is going to be somewhat different. Right? Yes. So I think the pattern that you'd see when you uncouple the muscle is going to look a little different from heart to heart. I mean, they, they grossly they're similar, but they're not stereotypical. You're not going to find the same branching network from heart to heart to heart. Yeah, perhaps you can have more chance to go transversely from the sides of the junction than when you do more. More safe route for cutting them through the left side. Nice. It could be two or six. Yeah. Right. Yeah. One of them is that now the Kinji system is less loaded right. because it feeds into less capital tissue. Right. That's this paradoxical. Right. It's not so paradoxical. It's really that, that's the term. It's very intuitive used. because yeah. because if you have less loading, yeah. you, you have more chance to succeed to the side. The muscle. That's one explanation that you're, you're, you're talking about. The other possibility is that, you know, before when you had well coupled tissue, even though those small Purkinje network branches did excite the tissue, they coalesced, so you didn't see so many independent waveforms. Because the conduct, you know, the, the connectivity was good enough for them to not show on the epicardium. By the time we get to the epicardium, 
Um, it's possible, except we see some of the breakthroughs are almost near the base of the heart. And it would, I don't know that they could coalesce and still only see the breakthrough at the apex in the normal. But it's a possibility. Yeah, so there's a difference in sensitivity. <coughs> so this is a somewhat higher power of what they look like. And I think that's right. The left and right actually do look somewhat different. This is um, right. So this is the hiss coming down and then starting to separate into the left and the right bundles. And this is <coughs> high power. So I guess getting back to your question, I'm suggesting you know some of these are all different thicknesses, right? And ramifying out in comp very complicated ways. It's going to be different from heart to heart. And in some areas, let's say here, this may fail in the normal situation when it's loaded with all this highly coupled myocardium. But maybe it's going to succeed in the conditional knockout when this is uncoupled. So we may see a breakthrough over here because this area is starting to get excited. But a different heart, you know, this part of the convection system, kinship fibers may not be there. Maybe it's going to be over here, and we'll see the breakthrough over in this region. It's going to be different from heart to heart. It's just a possible explanation. I, I mean, it's the one that seems most logical to us. Okay, any other? Thank you very much for a fantastic seminar. Record, record, record. Let's stop recording for the coming seminars. The next seminar. By Dr. Sylvia. Hopefully going to show you some stuff uh, a few years old looking ventricular myocardium. Uh, some of the other connections are expressed in the specialized conduction. These were, um, I think, the first mouse model of spontaneous ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation. These are three separate. Um, so we hypothesized, um, and I don't know that we've actually proved 40 are coupled normally, and we have this source sync mismatch. Actually, also with electrical remodeling, um, and we were talking. Um, particularly in the right ventricular myocytes, and an increase in cardia, um, much the way I think it was a paper from uh, Halife's group. I don't know if that's the answer for what's going on, why we have virtually no gap. Just as an aside, I wanted to mention this other experiment. Um, on the top is a mouse that's made completely from cells. This focus of cells uh, came from one of these ES cells that were null. For so it's probably no surprise at all that these mice so, connexin 43 null mice, uh, they're a long name for a syndrome, uh, but the jabs lab from Hopkins, um, a couple of there, um, and so I think they're really not yet enough. So, we wanted to know um, which phosphorylation sites through work that Paul and others had done were um, particularly interesting. And again, so for pan connexin 43, we're missing the phospho for inherited diseases are that they provide sort of a paradigm for thinking about the much sort of analogous question in terms of gap junctions is, is this, so that gets us back to this, um, this TAC model uh, of transverse aortic band. Uh, these are just some cross-section histological sections, quite high, and you can't really see this, but it's lower. So in this particular, um, this is immunostaining, so again, from sham to one week, we see that. Nice gap junction channels in the sham but it falls off very <coughs> It's not dramatic, um, but within one week, and certainly by maybe a handful better, um, but we always like to think about therapy because that's all. You know, that in some ways brings us back to the patient again, um, and they did better in terms of their heart failure, but the major benefit of both of these trials is ERVF. Yeah. Um, so we tried to set up, um, but if we look at the amino staining level, um, this is again the sham group that doesn't form as typical gap junction plaques as mid-spiralactin, no significant difference. 
as we showed before, if we do the aortic bandling group, it doesn't quite make it up statistically up to the consequences of that are sufficient uh, to support spontaneous separating the connexin protein into that which is in the junctional membrane, uh, five genotypes. Um, and with one extra lane, see what the gap structures are looking like. But um, it's conceivable then that but putting all of the sort of beluga solution experiments back then, uh, showing that we got normal breakthroughs of, of the overlying epicardial.